This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 3rd, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how some legislative candidates have become so focused on being pro-oil, they have lost focus on being pro-Alaskan. Second, we explain how some so-called progressive candidates have become so focused on increasing government spending that they are pushing revenue approaches that hurt the very working Alaska families they claim to be protecting. And third, we explain how those pushing Cook Inlet gas are increasingly ignoring market reality and in the process, looking more and more like those who pushed the Alaska barley and dairy projects of the late 1970s and 1980s. And now, let's join Michael. You picked some doozies for us today. We got some, um, we got some good stuff uh, going on. Let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, I want to talk a little bit here uh, about the sycophants in oil, can- you know, in the oil candidates. And, and I will just say this. I find it amazing that in a state that is mostly, well, it's reddish purple, but there are more registered Republicans and everything. I still find it amazing to me that more Republicans seem to be calling for government to step in to take care of things than I would have. Ex- if you'd told me 10 years ago that was the choice, I would have been like, what? That's not going to happen. Couldn't possibly happen. And yet here we are this morning. Give us, uh, give us the rundown. Well, we're cer- we're certainly going to get to get to that in segment three when we talk about Cook Inland, about people talking about government stepping in. But in segment one, I want to talk about I want to talk about oil taxes a little bit. We talked we talked about this at the end of last week's show. Joe Shearhorn and uh, Jim Jansen had written a letter to the editor that showed up about oil taxes, and I talked about that a little bit. Later in the week, they went full blown with a column. Uh, that uh, the title of which is Fair and Competitive Oil Taxes Are Working. And one of the sentences down in this, uh, or the, one of the paragraphs said, oil production forecast numbers are way up. North Slope oil production is expected to exceed 300, 630,000 barrels per day by the end of the decade, up from 442,000 barrels on August 15th. By the year 2032, the industry is on pace to produce more barrels of oil per day than any time in the, in the past 20 years. This is the key sentence. That will mean more revenue for the state, more jobs, and a stronger Alaska economy. That's a lie. As, as we've talked about on the show repeatedly since the spring revenue yep. forecast has come out, it shows that it shows this dramatic increase in production uh, going on. Uh, but it shows revenues, oil revenues staying flat. And, e- and, and even for those two segments of oil revenues, production taxes and royalties, that are most closely tied to production levels, it shows revenues going down over that period. The only reason oil revenues in total go up is because the the petroleum corporate income tax raises it back up above the break-even level by a slight amount. But it doesn't mean that the, the, the implication of this paragraph this will mean more revenue for the state. That's just that's just wrong. I mean, the spring revenue, all you have to do is look at the spring revenue forecast, and you know that's wrong. But even if that were true, that's not the standard. Every sentence about oil taxes should begin with 
reciting this sentence from the Alaska Constitution. It's Article 8, Section 2, the legislature shall provide for the utilization, development, and conservation of all natural resources belonging to the state, including land and waters, for the maximum benefit of the people. Every article about oil taxes, every comment about oil taxes should start with that sentence. And so the question isn't, are revenues up or revenues down? They're, in fact, down when they're, when you look at the ones that are tied to production levels. But it, the question isn't, are revenues up or revenues down? It is, the question is, are we receiving the maximum benefit from oil for the people? And the answer is, by every measure that I that I've looked at, we are about 400 to 500 million dollars short of the revenue maximization level the level of revenues that we could get before that re well, the state could get before the revenues started to eat away at the incentives for oil companies and production levels started down that 400 to 500 million dollars is is in play and what's going on is 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 it going to it's going to the oil companies right now Instead of go as as extra profits, if you will, compared to the profits that are established by the Alaska Constitution, it's going to the oil companies instead of Alaskans, and and that's just wrong. What what's 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 very troubling about this is you see you see this sort of comment now showing up in candidate statements. Walter Featherly, a candidate who's running against uh, an in so-called independent candidate running against Julie Cologne. We've already talked about Walter Featherly on the show. We'll talk about him again in the third segment. He's advocated that Ada come in and take over the cooking oil fields or cook inlet gas fields to, to make them, to, to essentially nationalize the cook inlet gas fields, to take them over and, and produce gas uh, produce gas for, for Alaskans. That's a problem. But here's Featherly's comment on the, on the Jansen and Sherhorn uh, uh, piece. Jim Jansen and Joe Sherhorn have it right. Alaska's oil and gas industry operates in an extreme remote and undeveloped environment, making the costs and risks among the highest in the world. Alaska depends both fiscally and to heat and power our state on a thriving oil and gas industry. Increasing their costs and risks by adding to their tax burden makes no sense. My opponent, Julie Colomb, supports policies such as, get this, mega PFDs. I've never seen Julie Colomb support a mega PFD in my life. Uh, that will add to the calls for increased taxes. I am proud to have the support of both Jim Jansen and Joe Shearhorn in this critical election. Nothing, nothing in that statement begins or even or even reflects anything out of Article 8, Section 2 of the Constitution talking about uh, maximum benefit uh, of using the resources for the maximum benefit of its people. It just talks about the oil industry. We need to, we need to, you know, make sure we bend over backwards for the oil industry because they got it tough up here and we need to make sure that they get they get what they need. Well, I don't disagree with that, but the state also should get what the Constitution provides the state should get. And there's a way of melding the two. And and that melding is, is sort of coming from the right and from the left has this four and five hundred million dollars, four to hundred to five hundred million dollars in the middle. And 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 Shearhorn and 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 Jansen and Featherly are all saying, oh, just keep that with the oil companies. Well, that's not right. That's not what should happen with it. It should come to the state. It's almost, Michael, as if, as if, as if these guys have become so focused on being pro-business and pro-oil, they've forgotten to be pro-Alaskan. They they have gone over to the other side, if you will. And said, we've got to bend over backwards for the oil industry. And, and let's not, you know, let's let's minimize or let's just not mention Article 8, Section 2 of the, Const of the Constitution and the obligations there. It is, it is good to be pro-business. It is good to be pro-oil. But it's also good to be pro-Alaskan. And I think, and it's also important to be pro-Alaskan. And I think right. what's happening is, is they're bending so far backwards over backwards trying to be pro business and pro oil that they that they that they're missing the part about being pro alaskan. So it's 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 troubling to see it, to see the the misrepresentation in Sherhorn and and Jansen's piece about about what revenues are doing but it's especially troubling now to see candidates picking up that that mantra and and becoming sycophants to the oil industry by saying, you know, yeah, okay, well, I, yeah, let, let's, let's let's just make sure the oil industry is happy. 
let's not worry about our obligations under Article 8, Section 2. You know, what's interesting is that I've seen many arguments and discussions about Article 8, Section 2. And in fact, it was interesting because one year uh, we were having a big discussion about it on the show and it was a continuing reoccurring theme coming back to that segment over and over that section over and over and over. And I literally had uh, politicians at the time arguing about what maximum benefit of the people meant. And many of them said, well, that means the maximum revenues to the state. That's what it means, which, you know, is not how I read it. And it's not how most people read it, because they said, as long as the state receives the revenue, that's the maximum benefit to the people. But even in that case, it doesn't hold true here because we're not getting more revenue. We have a finite resource that once you draw it out of the ground, it's not coming back. And we're not getting, you know, essentially all that we could out of it, which is what the mandate is. They're supposed to be the purveyors and the the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, folks who are in charge of all that. And yet they seem to think it's all OK. And in fact, they'll willingly tell lies in. The, I mean, that's just that's insane. Yeah, the the standard. I mean, what we've got is we've gotten caught up in, in as a lot of time happens in politics here. We've gotten caught up in this in this extremes, right? Some people say we got to go back to SB twenty one, or uh, I'm sorry, go go back to Aces. That's that's where we need to take revenues. Well, Aces proved that it wasn't working. Aces proved that it wasn't attracting the investment necessary to to maximize the benefit of our resources because we weren't having investment in the ground to develop those resources. Now other people are saying, well, SB twenty or SB twenty one. We've got to stick on SB twenty one. Well, the problem is. As it enters its second decade, as we've talked on the show before, and as I've written about in the column, as it enters its second decade, SB 21 is showing some problems. It's showing that under the circumstances that we're coming into in the next decade, it doesn't work to, to maximize the benefit of the, of the resource for the benefit of Alaskans. It's giving too much of the revenue over to uh, the oil companies. We need to find the place. We can find the place. We know, actually, we know where that place is. Sort of between those two, that's not ACEs, that doesn't go to the extreme of ACEs, but that, but that fixes SB 21 to reflect that, that Alaskans do get a share of the revenues, of the additional revenues that are being generated by the additional volumes that are, that are being produced. You can look at the percentage take uh, from, from oil, pre-ACEs, ACEs, SB 21 and, and currently. And what's happening is ACES was an all-time high. It took something like 30% of the gross revenue. SB 21 brought it back down to the high teens. What's happening in this decade under SB 21, the way it's operating as it creaks on, is we're coming down to like 14% of the revenues. We're we're not getting, we're not achieving the constitutional obligation. Of of maximizing the benefit uh, to Alaskans, we need to we need to go after that. And things like these comments from Shearhorn, I mean the lies from Shearhorn and Jansen about about increased revenues, and and the sycophant uh, adoption of those lies by by candidates like Featherly that says, "Oh, I side with the oil industry uh, over over Alaska." I mean that's that's just just galling. Brad Donna says something interesting. She said. We don't know, actually, that raising taxes on oil won't result in less money for government. ACES showed us that it can result in less money for government. But I think the point here is, is that it's not the end-all, be-all. There's more choices than just going straight back to ACES. And I think that's the argument here is, you know, if we're leaving money on the table, this is what we need to be, this is what we need to be uh, talking about. And of course, you know, the, they obviously don't want to talk about it. They'll spend millions of dollars trying to prevent us from talking about it because it will save them millions more, which I guess to protect their shareholders, that's what they're supposed to do. But at the same time, the, as the trustees of the resource, our legislature should be all in for us. I mean, the executives in the agencies and the, and the trade uh, associations, they're all in for their people. Our legislators should be all in for us. Yep, exactly right, Michael. And and it's not. I mean, this is not. You can't. You can't calculate these things to an absolute math, mathematical certainty. But you can study decline curves and 
and prices and and revenue and and production levels and you can get a feel for what the revenue maximization point is uh with respect to oil and we're well below it i mean i've written about it now in in four or five columns in the landmine uh and i've looked at it closely uh, uh in connection with you know all the ongoing stuff we do with respect to oil and we're running below it now does it benefit the oil companies? Sure, it does. Do the oil companies like it? Sure, they do. Do they? Do, does it? Does it help promote investment here because they're getting supra returns? They're getting returns over the revenue maximization level. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you, no doubt about it. But that's not the balance that the Constitution says we ought to strike. The balance that the Constitution says we ought to strike is. Uh, uh, providing for the utilization, development, and conservation of all natural resources belonging to the state for the maximum benefit of its people. And that's the balance that the Constitution tells us to strike. And when you have legislative candidates like Featherly, who are out there that don't even mention that sentence, don't even mention that balance, don't even mention on the one hand, on the other hand, let's find, let's find what lands in the middle. Don't even do that. Uh, that's very concerning. Because you have candidates who essentially are saying, yeah, I know what the Alaska Constitution, or, or maybe they don't. I know what the Alaska Constitution says, but we need to bend over backwards for oil here. I mean, Shearhorn and Jansen have, have had this long history of, of defending, you know, the oil industry. They were, they were in on SB21. They've been in on the defense of SB21 since it was passed. Fine. SB21 was important at the time because it got us rebalanced with where we were under ACES. But now, as we're entering the second decade of SB21, we are seeing problems show up. Like anything that runs 10 years, you're seeing problems show up on it, show up in it. And you need to fix those problems so that this balance uh, uh, required by the Constitution uh, uh, is, uh, is achieved. Featherly's comment, there's one other thing about Featherly's comment that just irritates the heck out of me. It says, you know, it, he goes on to the defense of, S of SB21. Then he says, my opponent, Julie Colomb supports policies such as mega PFDs. And what Featherly is saying, we shouldn't worry about mega PFDs. We should worry about bending over backwards for the oil industry. Well, that's, we should, we should worry about both. We should worry about making sure the industry has the, the incentives it needs to develop the resources, which is important to us to get those resources developed. But we should also ensure that it's done under fiscal, uh, 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 provisions that ensure that Alaskans get their fair share and that ensure that PFDs, for example, get their fair share. We shouldn't be bending, we shouldn't be saying, oh, mega PFDs, bad, oil, good. We should be saying, how do we find a way that maximizes the benefit for Alaskans? <clears throat> Part of which is to is to have an incentive for the industry to continue to develop. Absolutely. All right. Brad Keithley continues with us. The weekly top three. We're continuing on here. Uh, let's go on to number two. Uh, let's talk about the inconsistency of some of Alaska's more progressive candidates. Brad, what are you, what are you talking about there? You accuse me, Michael, sometimes of getting into these Twitter fights or Facebook fights, and and um, uh, and I do. Uh, but I always, uh, but I, but I do them because I learn something from them. I mean, I challenge somebody's statement uh, and and have an right. exchange with them that helps me better understand what the position is. We had we had somebody on Twitter who posted and said, you know, Alaska needs to be more progressive. We need to, you know, we need to do all th these things. We need to expect. We need to have. We need to fund K through twelve better. We need to do this. We need to do that. And I and my response was, my response was, I'm genuinely curious. What does progressive mean in this state, especially since so many so-called progressives support funding government using the most regressive tax ever proposed. Um, and then I got I got an answer that listed the progressive the progressive uh, uh, objectives: proper government managed, feeding starving Alaskans, not privatizing education, growing the core of the permanent fund, getting federal dollars dot dollars, giving SOA uh, state of Alaska uh, employees retirement security, properly taxing extraction resources, the maximum benefit for Alaskans, the opposite of of the GOP. Most of those things, most of those things are on the spending side. Most of those things are we need to spend more on K through 12. We need to we need to grow. Uh, uh, we need to ensure that there's retirement security uh, for uh, for state of Alaska employees. 
We need to spend more dollars to match the federal dollars on, on DOT. Most of those things are on the spending side. And that's how progressives in this state, by and large, define themselves on the spending side. But there's a huge internal inconsistency in what they're doing. A lot of them, Andy Josephson, Zach Field, Matt Clayman, a lot of them say we need to grow on the spending side and we need to fund that growth by cutting the PFD. The PFD is the most regressive, regressive tax, according to Matt Berman, ICER professor, the most regressive tax ever proposed, not ever implemented, ever proposed, most regressive. So what's going on is, is they're defining all these programs on the spending side, they say are progressive and will help Alaskan families out. At the same time, they're funding those by taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaskans, increasing poverty levels. What Matt Berman has told us through his research is when you use PFD cuts to fund government, you're increasing the poverty levels. So if you're so concerned about starving Alaskans, why are you taking money out of the pockets of the Alaskans that are starving? Why are you increasing the number of Alaskans that are starving by increasing poverty levels, by taking money out of their pockets? It's, it's, it, it, the inconsistency is just sort of stark uh, when they talk about uh, all these spending programs they want to do. But then Zach Fields, uh, 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 Andy Josephson, then they step back and say, oh, we need to do it out of PFD cuts because, you know, huge PFDs, we, we, need, to, we need to cut those down. They're taking them, I don't really care about what happens to the top 20%, but they're taking them out of the pockets. They're taking those PFD, 80% of Alaska families fall in middle, middle and lower income brackets. They're taking the money out of the pockets of the very people they say they're protecting. So it's not, I don't, they're not really protecting who they say they're protecting. They're yeah. injuring oh. No, they're injuring the people they say they're protecting. They're doing something else. Well, I, and I think Rob, Senator Rob Myers of the chat room says progressive means bigger government, not best for the people. Progressives hate the PFD because it gives power back to the people instead of the government. And he's right. I mean, they can decide how it's best to spend that money. They can have the most direct impact on their family when the money comes straight to them and they can decide how to spend it. Uh, when it takes it out of the hands of politicians who are going to decide how it's best for you to live your life or spend your money, they hate that, you know, and you were pretty kind on the way that this person responded to you, you know, feeding starving Alaskans. That's proper government management, like feeding starving Alaskans, not pri privatizing ed, growing the core of the permanent fund, getting more state dollars, giving the state of Alaska retirement security. I mean, th th you know, it just sounds like we're so bad at all this stuff. And if it was, if we were just smart, we'd get on board with this. Yeah. And, but even, I mean, just take that at face value, even at face value, that's what they say. That's what they say their objective is. Just take that at face value. The way they're funding it is undoing all of those, all of those ob objectives. They say they're doing it to benefit working Alaska families. They say they're doing it to benefit low income Alaska families, to give them a, a safety net. But the way they're funding it is is undoing it immediately. It's like it, it's like this circle. It's like you know I'm giving you with the right hand, but I'm going to take it right back with the left hand, and so and so you end up net in the same place. They feel better because they say that they're that they're doing these things, but the net effect of taking that of, of the way they're funding it is taking money out from from underneath uh, underneath the very families they say. They say they're protecting. So that internal inconsistency, I mean, the first segment was about bashing, you know, some people for the internal inconsistency of saying I'm protecting the Alaskans by by protecting the oil industry. That's wrong. And now and now we've got, you know, this this other segment of, 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 of the political spectrum saying I'm defending Alaskans by taking money out of the, the pockets of the very people I say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to improve, improve their lives. We, we people aren't thinking through. Well, maybe they are, and they're just ignoring it. But people aren't thinking through the consequences of the positions they're taking. They're undoing the very constituencies that they say they're there to protect.
Well, and, and part of the problem here is, is that it's creating, we're here to save people who are on the raggedy edge and who, who can't feed themselves and everything else. So let's make a whole new class of people who can't feed themselves or anything else by taking this money. And now we've just bolstered our argument and now we have even more. And now, I mean, this is my argument is that it's on purpose because even now we've got even more people who then need more money. So we have to take more to feed them. And it's this, again, this progressive doom loop of we're going to create a larger and larger dependency state and therefore we'll justify taking all the monies and running it because you know we 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 know what's best for you and you know some of them some of the some of the candidates come back and say well what do you want us to do i mean we've got to fund these somehow well fund them propose funding them in a way that's consistent with what your objective is you say you want to protect Middle and lower income Alaska families. You say you want to protect uh, 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 working Alaska families. Well, fund it in a way that's consistent with that. Go after you know the four hundred to five hundred million dollars in oil that we're not that we're not getting. Go after the you know do a broad based tax that would include non residents and get them to contribute the ten percent that they're not that they're not contributing currently. That would reduce the 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 tax levels on the the tax imposition on all Alaskans by getting non-residents to uh to to do part of that and the and the response usually is oh that's too hard we can't accomplish that i mean it was sort of like jesse keel sort of like your conversation with jesse keel about the about the pft well i can't i can't get those revenues the other way so i'm just going to continue taking them out of out of the pf through pfd cuts i'm going to continue taking them out of middle and lower income alaska jack uh, uh, families the objective is to spend the money and i really don't care where the money comes from yeah it'd be nice to get it other ways but I'm not going to say that's part of my program. I, I'm just going to get the money however I can, even if I'm hurting the very people that I say I'm trying to defend. Be consistent. Be All I'm asking is be consistent across the board. If you're trying to help this segment of people on the spending side, then don't you know bash them on the, on the revenue side. Be consistent on both the spending and revenue side and see how that plays out. See how people accept it. See what the top 20% does when, oh, you're going to have to pay part of this. Right. right. Uh, yeah. And then the, then the shoes on the other foot and then they're like, well, whoa, wait a second. Maybe we don't need quite everything that we suggested. Uh, but in the meanwhile, you're creating your own dependency state. And again, that progressive doom loop of, you know, we'll take more because we've got to feed the people and we've created more people to feed by taking more. And that means we have to take more to feed the more people. And it's just, I mean, it's 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 madness. It really, really is. And it, it is an example of the politician's disease of we know better than you how this money should be spent. When we know from, I mean, years and years and years of looking where money goes when it goes into private hands versus public hands, we know it will turn more times in the economy if it goes straight to the people. But as Rob pointed out, that means a loss of control. And they just can't have that. Progressives, I mean, well, even Republicans, but progressives especially, they don't want a loss of control as to how that money's spent. They have the better ideas. Yeah, I have a little bit of I have a little bit of different different view on that than Rob. They don't. I, I it's it's loss of control, but I think it's also going back to something Scott Kendall said a long time ago. It's also they don't want to put the funding for their programs up before the top 20%. They don't want the top 20% to have to consider whether they're going to fund those programs because they know they know the answer is going to be no. So they prefer they 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 you know Alaska is unique in that we have the permanent fund dividend you're able to tax target your tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. They prefer going that direction because the priority is to spend. We don't really care about how we raise the money. The priority is to spend. They prefer going that direction than going a, a broad base direction that would that would create a role for the top twenty percent uh, in pushing back on it. They don't want they don't want that to happen. It's um, I mean this is and again this is the problem with Alaska and and we're talking about progressives, but as I mentioned earlier, I mean there's a lot of Republicans. That's why it's so hard these days, Brad, to really have a label and stick with it because it used to be. You know, you had the D's and the R's, and then you had the conservatives and the and the progressives and everything else. But really what it comes down to is bigger government. Do you support bigger, more stronger, more centralized government, or do you do you, a smaller 
more manageable, decentralized, more individualist type government. And that's really what the, th those are really what the labels should be these days. Yeah, I agree, Michael. And and the PFD is a good place to, to, to find that, to find those differences. Those that support PFDs actually support a smaller government, more money in the hands of, of, of citizens. Those that, that talk about like Featherly does a mega PFD or, or the, the, progressive that I that I engaged with on on Twitter that sort of ignores where the revenues are coming from they uh, they just want a bigger government that the priority is a bigger government more government spend they don't really care what where the revenues come from and they don't really care who the revenues who the revenues they're raising impact even if it's the people that they that they say are the priority their priority Donna pulled one from the wayback machine Reagan said, government's method of dealing with the economy, if it's not moving, incentivize it. If it moves too fast, regulate it. If it slows down, subsidize it. I mean, that's, you know, and that's kind of where we're at right now. I mean, again, every time we look at this, it's like well, government's got to be involved in some way, some form, somehow. Um, and this, again, I think comes back, this is not really Brad's purview, but I think it comes back to we've had now multiple generations of people going to the indoctrination centers of the public school saying government is the solution to every problem. I mean, it doesn't matter what the problem is. Government is the solution, period. Full stop. And we've gotten to that point now where you see it. You see people talking to, you know, man on the street interviews where people are just like, well, that's a government should be taking care of everything, shouldn't they? I mean, they don't understand why they don't have any money, why they can't afford a house, why they can't put retirement away. They don't understand any of that. But they think government should be taking care of everything. And they realize that they had all that money back from the government. They may be able to take care of themselves a little bit better, Brad. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. But but this goes this goes a step further than that. I mean, what's really going on in Alaska is unique in that debate. Because what's going on in Alaska is is the progressives are saying we need more government, we need a bigger government, we need a bigger government role, we need more government spending on K through 12. But they're taking it out of the pockets of the very people they claim to be protecting. It, there, there's not even an effort to do it on a broad-based basis, there's not even an effort, frankly, to do it on a on a uh, you know trying to go get the additional four to five hundred million dollars from the oil industry and and holding on the additional spending until they do that. The additional spending is so important to them that they're willing to 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 cut their own people. They're willing to take it out of the pockets of the people that that, that they're claiming to protect out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. They're willing to create a system where they're increasing the number of people in poverty, increasing the number of people that are being adversely uh, affected, increasing the number that they claim they're, they're concerned about, they're doing it themselves through the revenue measure that they're proposing. So it's not, it's not just, it's not just the sort of the usual progressives, we need bigger government versus conservatives, we need smaller government progressives, we need to develop more money or we need to raise more revenue conservatives, you need to leave more money in the pockets uh, of citizens. This is the, the revenue measure they're using is targeted. You can't, you can't ignore that fact. It's targeted on the very working families, the very middle and lower income Alaska families that they say they're protecting. So I, to me, Alaska, Alaska progressives, Alaska progressives are going a step beyond the old debate of bigger government or smaller government. Alaska progressives are saying basically, Andy Josephson, uh, 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 Zach Fields, Alaska progressives are saying bigger government, even if it hurts middle and lower working Alaska families, even if it hurts them, we need, we need bigger government. Even if it hurts the very people that we claim we're trying to protect. So I, there's, there's something about Alaska progressives that, is even more disingenuous, even more uh, internally inconsistent than your normal run-of-the-mill uh, progressive. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey Coghill says, lords and serfs is the end game. I mean, you know, I mean, I've talked about the legislature and some the, being the nouveau riche nobility. I've talked about that. Congress being the nouveau riche nobility. We see many of them go to, go to, uh, to Congress with barely a six-figure 
uh, uh, you know, uh, personal worth. And then within just a few years, they're all multimillionaires. I mean, this is exactly where we're at in all this, because again, they know better than you. That's what it all comes down. Um, well, and again, in Alaska, it is, it is more so than, it, I mean, the legislature by voting them the salary increase, they voted themselves, but all of them in the top 20%, all of the legislators are now in the top 20%. They voted themselves out of the bracket that gets affected by by the revenue measures they're using. They've put yeah. themselves above and beyond that. So, yeah, it's they are the nouveau riche because they yeah. voted themselves the 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 salary increase that puts them in that bracket. Uh, Rob says we've had huge amount of monies for so long that we could have bigger government with no taxes, keeping both sides happy. Then conservatives figured out that they could make money from that bigger government using the permanent fund, like Congress using debt, in an attempt to keep the broken model going. That's the thing. We're continuing to try and live high on the hog like we did for so long, and nobody's willing to feel the pain. That's the thing. We're either going to get sick from the cure or we're going to die from the disease, and nobody seems like they're willing to get sick from the cure. There's going to be pain points if you have to pull that back, and and nobody nobody seems to be willing to do that. It's just... Well, they're, they're they're willing to impose that pain on middle and lower income Alaska families. True. They're willing to target that pain yeah. on middle and lower income Alaska families because it's the proven very that ones they, they say they're protecting. Yeah, because it's proven that they won't squawk, right? They're not going to squawk big enough. They don't want to face the pain of having to face that top 20 percentile who would be like, whoa, 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 we can't pay for that. Welcome back to it. The Michael Duke Show, Tuesday edition of the show. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, comes in for the weekly top three in our Tooth Tuesday segment. Down to the last segment this morning, Brad, um, I'm amazed at how many people who supposedly run for the platform of smaller, more limited government are advocating for more government intervention in the free market because we just can't make it and uh, we need to do it. And if we're not, we're derelict in our duty and all this. I mean, give me the rundown here on this uh, gas thing and the subsidies. So Nat Hertz wrote an article for his new journal, the, the Northern Germ Journal, that gets picked up by various publications around the state. The headline in in the the in that article on that article in the ADN was small cook inlet producers say they need state government help before drilling for new natural gas. All right. Let's think about this for a moment. We now know for sure that we're moving toward LNG as our marginal source of, of gas supply. We've had enough statements from Chugach, from NSTAR, from the, the partner that they're working with uh, to develop the uh, an LNG cap you know, capability that we know we're moving toward LNG. Everybody, I think wrongly, but everybody says LNG is much more expensive. We, we want to avoid that LNG because it's much more expensive. All right, so Cook Inlet producers have gas they say they can develop. We know the marginal source of supply is going to be LNG. So Cook Inlet producers ought to be able to command a price that's equal to the LNG price, less a penny, to, to keep us from going to that marginal source of supply, to supply the Cook Inlet supplies. They ought to be able to command a price that's that, that price, less a penny or less a nickel or, or not much. I mean, they probably could get away with just charging the same price as LNG. Um, but but they're saying in the face of that, they're saying in the face of that, that they still need government help. Small cook inlet producers say they need state government help before drilling for new natural gas. What they're essentially saying is we're not competitive with imported LNG. We know we ought to be able to get a price equal to LNG or a price equal to LNG less a penny. We know that that's our competitive target. And we know people say that LNG is so expensive, so we ought to be able to get a so expensive price less a penny. That ought to be what we could achieve with, with, a, with a new contract for supply. But that's not good enough. We still need additional government interference. We still need additional government incentives in order to produce. What they're telling us is that Cook Inlet Supplies, the marginal Cook Inlet Source of Supply, the marginal source of supply that could be added out there is more expensive than LNG. If they still need government subsidies to bring that supply on when we know they could get the cook the 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 LNG imported price less a penny, 
If they still need government subsidies, what we know is Cook Inlet supplies are more expensive than LNG. And they want the state government, ultimately through PFD cuts, because that's where the marginal source of revenue comes from currently. They want state government, they want middle and lower income Alaska families through bearing additional PFD cuts to pay for it. I, we don't need to be subsidizing producers in this state, oil and gas producers in this state. It's great if they can sell it at what the at what the LNG price is for, and we get and we get local supplies. That's fine, but we don't need to be subsidizing what are now admittedly uncompetitive small producers, uh, small Cook Inlet producers. We don't need to be subsidizing them uh, to provide additional supplies to the state. The you know everybody says energy costs are one of the most important things about about you know maintaining an, the, the economy of Alaska. We need to maintain low energy costs. Well, now you're talking about energy costs that would exceed the LNG costs to try to bring on these additional Cook Inlet supplies. It's, it's, it's government intervention run amok. It, it's, it's the equivalent, Michael, of, of Governor Hammond's Barley Project. It's the equivalent of saying, we're going to throw enough government money at a project so that we're going to be able to grow barley in Alaska and make it competitive in the lower 48, because we want to have a barley, we, we want to ha- we want to grow barley up here. We think we can grow it. We want to grow it up here. So we're going to have a government project to throw money at it. Well, there's no difference between that and what we're now talking about in terms of the Cook Inlet. We just want to, we just want to throw additional money at it because, by gosh, we want Alaska grown natural gas as opposed to for the marginal source, as opposed to as opposed to LNG. We, we ought to focus on the economics like, like you know, you and I have been talking about since the beginning. We ought to focus on the economics. What's the cheapest source of energy to Alaskans now that we're now that we're facing, you know, the right. situation in the Cook Inlet? What's the cheapest alternative to Alaskans? And it turns out now even the small Alaska producers are admitting it's LNG. Right. Well, that's what kills me on this, because even Nat Hers mentions that. He says, but the utilities have not announced. He says, many Alaska lawmakers who pride themselves on the state's petroleum producing heritage hate the idea of imports and the substantial price increases expected to come with them and have been agitating for more local production. They hate the ideas of imports because they pride themselves on the state's petroleum production heritage. That's the thing. It's an emotional tie. If it doesn't make sense financially, then you move on to the next financially most sound financial, you know, financial making sense. I mean, that's that's what seems to be here. But everybody wants to avoid that and never looking at the downstream or the overall cost. Oh, we'll just do the royalties. Well, what's the cost? Well, it doesn't matter because then it'll be Alaska gas and we'll all feel good about burning Alaska gas. And we can feel warm and fuzzy about it because we didn't get it from somebody else. But that's not the qu- the question is how much does it cost? That's the problem. And like you said, they're all now admitting that LNG imports is the is the cheaper long well short term and maybe long term solution. Yeah, and and you know and th- that same comment you just read uh, uh, focused on cost, right? We want the, the legislators want to keep uh, Alaska gas because and and they're concerned about cost. Well, from a standpoint of cost. LNG is cheaper, all in. I mean, what the legislators want to want to do, what some want to do, is say, just look at the price. Don't focus on anything else. Just look at the price that that NSTAR is going to enter into with these with these with these producers, and and that price may be below the LNG price. But you have to add in the subsidy that's being created by taking money out of the PFD. The subsidy that's being created. By foregoing the revenue, uh, the, the royalty revenue that uh, that the state is that the state's entitled to, you have to add that in. And when you add that in, the all-in cost. I mean, what essentially these producers are admitting, the all-in cost is going to be above the LNG price. So, if you're concerned about cost, if that's set everything else aside, if you're concerned about cost, as we should be in Alaska because energy costs are high. If you're concerned about cost, you should be going with LNG because that's the lower cost option. That's what the what the utility analysis told us last year that, that you and I have been through numerous times on the show. That's what these producers are now admitting uh, continues to be the case, that the LNG cost is cheaper, that they can't compete 
with the LNG price. They can't make their economics work when they match the LNG price minus a penny. They can't make their economics work. They need a government subsidy in addition to that, in addition to that high price to make them work, a government subsidy that that's paid for out of additional PFD cuts. So it's... <laughs> It, it, we need to focus on the economics. I mean, this goes back to a discussion you and I had a long time ago, but we need to focus the economics. What's the cheapest alternative? And now even the small producers are admitting the cheapest alternative is LNG. I thought it was interesting that uh, in there, they uh, he mentions the fact that uh, a couple of the legislators filed a letter asking if they were, uh, here we go, this made Hill Corp a target. In a formal letter to the FTC this month, two Anchorage state senators asked the agency to investigate what they call, quote, illegal anti-competitive practices by the company, unquote, and actions by Hill Corp that they said created a scarcity of supply. That's the other question that I have on this, because is this a fake crisis, Brad? I mean, is this a, you know, with the complicity of NSTAR or whoever else, I mean, is this a, is it real? Because I've, I've gotten emails from people who said I worked on the oil, I've worked in the gas fields and I know that they have fields that are capped and all this other kind of stuff. And it raises a lot of questions. Obviously I hadn't heard that anybody had filed a letter, but apparently it's the deal. Here they are. Is it creating a scarcity on purpose? Yeah, Hillcorp is benefiting from this scarcity. I mean, recall when Wilikowski and Kathy Giesel uh, tried to close the Hillcorp loophole, tried to close the Hillcorp $100, $100 million loophole last legislature. And then Hillcorp wrote a letter essentially threatening their investments in Cook Inlet uh, if, the leg if the legislators did that. So Hillcorp is benefiting from this situation. Um, they also may benefit, frankly, when their contracts are up in terms of higher price because they created a lower, a lower supply uh, situation. I've gotten some emails from people that of course I can't go out and verify whether they were really employed, but they're telling stories about how some of this stuff is being capped off. And it, this is in their view intentional because it helps them maximize their, they keep the pressure on and that way they can maximize their profits under the current scheme. And like you said, when they go back to renegotiate for new contracts, they can get even more. I mean, that's part of the problem here. Yeah, it's uh, so it's they've sent a letter to the FTC, whether the FTC does anything on the basis of two Alaska senators um, uh, sending them a letter. I mean, the Alaska government officially isn't the attorney general isn't asking for an investigation by the FTC. It's not even a, a resolution from the full Senate. It's not even a, it's certainly not a resolution from the full legislature asking for the investigation. So whether the FTC you know, opens a docket on the basis of a letter from two of uh, of of twenty uh, Alaska senators is you know we'll see, uh, but I, I I wouldn't hold my breath uh, for the FTC uh, to to right. make that a pri priority, but it is. I mean, Hillcorp is getting an advantage, even if they haven't renegotiated higher prices, and they and they did get some higher prices during the shortage we had during the shortage we had last last uh, uh, last winter. But even if they aren't getting higher prices, they are being able to use it as leverage, like they did this last legislature on the on the hundred million dollars. They got they got a hundred million dollar return basically on 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 this shortage that's going on in uh, in the Cook Inlet by being able to deflect Giesel and 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 Wilikowski and others from pressing forward on the on closing the Hillcorp loophole. So they are getting a benefit of it, but but. The point is, the point is, we shouldn't be subsidizing producers in the Cook Inlet. We now have the marginal source of supply set at LNG. That's the target. That's the bogey, the price bogey, if you will. If you come in a penny below that, then then it's better to 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 buy that from a producer who's coming in a penny below the LNG price than than the LNG price. That's the bogey, and we're having producers saying, "Ah, oh, I can't even compete against that." I need a subsidy on top of that, and on top of that higher price to uh, to, to in, entice me to uh, to produce. So we've just, we, we, as the study, as the utility study told us last summer, not this summer, last summer, as the utility study told us last summer, LNG, as expensive as some people believe it is, is still the cheapest source of additional supply of gas 
into the cooking and we ought to just get go forward with that and stop trying to you know think about subsidizing others to come in and uh, and fill that hole it, it, you, you just reminded me did we ever see that second report that nstar no. was supposed to be putting out right no. i mean they had a they had a report that said lng was the way to go but don't worry we're looking deeper into that we're going to have another report and that was supposed to be out february or march or something and here we are in september and we still haven't seen it we never did see that second report no we never have it may show up yet in some of the proceedings in the in the proceedings that chugach may kick off or instar may kick off as they as they go down the road on lng we may see it yet then but we haven't seen it and so well all we've got and they know that all we've got all we've got is is last summer's report that says that LNG of of the of the bad options are all bad because they're all high priced, but of the right. bad options, LNG is the lowest price of those of those bad options, lower than additional Cook Inlet supplies. And now the producers in Cook Inlet are proving that correct by saying we need subsidies, even though we know the competitive price is LNG. We need subsidies on top of that to be able to produce. Again, for an emotional response. I mean, I'm all for burning Alaska gas. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for using Alaska oil and using Alaska gas. But the problem is, is that if it's not economical and we then then we're you know, we could all be proud about being freezing to death in the dark because we can't afford the gas. Right. I mean, that's part of the problem. It's the whole argument about Alaska crude being turned into gasoline when we used to do it ourselves. Now we ship it down to what Cherry Creek or Cherry Point down there in Washington and have it shipped back as gasoline because we couldn't afford to do it ourselves. I mean, it just, it, you know, do you want to pay $7 a gallon for gas or do you want to pay $4 a gallon for gas? I mean, that's kind of the question. It is the question, Michael. And, and, it's, and it's an important question. I mean, energy prices are, are already high up here. Do we want to add on additional costs by throwing subsidies after, after non-competitive projects? Do we want to grow barley up here? I mean, this is, this is the perfect analogy. Do we want to grow barley up here by just throwing a bunch of government money at it? Because, you know, we've got we've got the climate conditions that can grow barley. Do we want to throw a m- bunch of money and grow barley? And even though it's non-competitive in the in the market, do we want to do that because we just want a barley industry? Well, that's exactly what we're that's exactly the same thing we're talking about in the Cook Inlet. Do we want to throw a bunch of government money in terms of in terms of of, of repealed incent or repealed obligations? Do we want to throw a bunch of money at these producers just to continue to have Alaska gas? No. We should go for what makes the most economic sense. Uh, 40 seconds here, Brad. Final thoughts for today. What if people just tune into this show for the first time? They're like, what is going on? What, what's your final thoughts? My final thoughts go back to the first two segments. We've got, we've got candidates out there who are second fans for oil, who are, who are saying we need to protect oil, even though, uh, even though we're, we're giving super, super profits, we're giving extra money to oil. We need to continue those to oil. No, we don't need to do that. On the other, on the other extreme, progressives are saying we need to spend money, even if we take it from the very people we're trying to protect. Even if we increase poverty levels in this state, we need to spend that money because we have people in poverty, and so we need to create more poverty because we need to spend money to. It's just we we've, we've got craziness on both sides of the spectrum. We need, we need to find a way. We need to find a way to get toward the middle, both on both on oil revenues and on the balance of government spending versus revenues. Brad, thank you so much. Enjoy yourself, my friend. Thanks for coming on board as usual. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.